Hi everybody, this is Kim at Sassy Jack Stitchery in Yonder Ways and we are going to work through our beginning needlepoint class with you online. So we've taught this class in the shop many times to lots of different folks at lots of different um, skill levels and you know it's I think most people have actually finished their design so I feel really good about it and I hope you enjoy it. Um, the first lesson that we're going to do today really is just going to walk you through some of the basics, you know, the ground fabric, the fibers that we're going to be using, some of the tools, some of the things that you would see in needlepoint that you don't necessarily need in this class, but you might use later on. Um, and then we'll get you started with, um, you know, a couple of the basic stitches. So this is a really super easy thing. We teach it in a three hour class in Sassy Jack's. We will um, break it into at least two lessons and probably three because the third one I think will show you will be finishing um, if you want to finish this into something utilitarian. So it's great to make beautiful designs that you can have framed and hang on your wall. Um, it's also fun to have some things that are just utilitarian, especially when you're doing these small little practice and learning pieces. Um, you might not necessarily want to frame it and hang it on your wall forever, but you might be able to use it and put it in your kit. And then when you look back on it, as you, you know, move on to other types of needlework or you learn more about this skill set, you'll remember how much fun you had learning this. So um, that's kind of the goal for this. So what you see here is the piece that I used to teach in class. You see, I have bent it up a few times because I have, this is my um, class stitching piece. So when the other students are stitching and practicing, I'm working on this. And this is how far I've gotten on this one since I started teaching this class. Um, this is one of my um, practice pieces. So when I'm teaching the students how to do some of the stitches, this is one of the pieces that I've used over time. So you can see different stitches on here. Um, this is a Rhodes heart. You see that in the middle. That's one of the stitches that you're going to learn. This is a Rhodes box. Um, that will also fit in the middle of this design perfectly. So this is one of the stitches that you'll learn. If you don't like the heart, you can do the box or the square. Um, this is a waffle stitch. You see this stitch here. This is a knitted braiding stitch. And you'll see this on the side. Um, this is basket weave. And so I'm also going to teach you basket weave. Now on the pattern that we're going to use, um, basket weave is not shown, but you will notice that I used it to fill in the blank space here. And that's a pretty traditional use of basket weave. It's often used um, to create some durability in fabric or to create a background that you might then put something over. Um, so I didn't stitch over it. I just filled in around my heart with it. And basket weave is a pretty important stitch. It's not the easiest stitch in the world to do, so we'll spend some time on that, and you'll practice that. It's methodical and enjoyable once you get it, though. It's fun to do once you once you just practice it a little bit. Um, so this is my little practice piece. What you're going to get if you signed up for the kit from us is um, three pieces of canvas. So you're going to get two blank pieces of canvas. One for the front of your design, which I just showed you here, which would be this. And then if you decided to make this into a scissor keep, you see a pair of small embroidery scissors fits in there perfectly. So if you decided to make this into a scissor keep, you would need a back. And if you position this right on here, you'd have enough room on here to do it. But, you know, we're learning and we're going to do it right in the middle. Um, and so you need a second piece. And so I've provided you with a second piece if you want to do that. Um, and then you have a practice piece. And this practice piece is almost the same size, um, but it might be a little smaller because I'm just using some of the odd pieces that, you know, weren't quite six by six inches. Um, so your two pieces that you'll have to stitch on for real will be six inch squares. Um, and then you'll have a practice piece that may be six inches or it may be just a little shy of that or a little over depending on what was kind of left over from all the cuts. And then you told me if you got that kit, what your favorite color was. And I picked a skein of watercolors thread for you. Um, so you'll have that in your kit and you'll have two number 22 needles and they're going to be John James. And so, um, and they're tapestry needles, so they are not sharp and that's important. You don't want them to be sharp because you don't want to split threads. You want them to be tapestry needles. So you'll have two number 22 John James needles, one to use 
and one to lose, as my uh, friend Susan Grinning Davis likes to say, because generally you will lose it. Um, so in your little kit, the $15 kit, if you bought that from us, and you don't have to, if you've got the stuff at home, use what you've got, um, you're going to get this little set of items here. And then we're going to email you or put out there for download, probably we'll email it to you, a set of instructions um, for you to um, print out and use. And they'll have some stitch diagrams on there. And the the main instruction that we're using is um, a free download from Michael Boren. And Michael Boren was my needlepoint teacher in my 30s. I um, really wanted to do one of his pieces. And I called him up and asked him if I could come to class, having had no needlepoint experience whatsoever. And um, we talked for a few minutes, and he was like, yeah, sure, come on, you know, you can do it. And I loved his approach to that, you know, and I think that approach um, follows through with a lot of teachers right right now in the industry is if you, if you have the motivation, um, you can do it. You know, I mean, needlepoint is not hard. It's just it's just stitches, right, needle and thread. And, um, you know, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a love of needle and thread um, or an interest in it at least. So, you know, I think you can definitely do this. And I think you can do some pieces that are um, more advanced than this. But what we use in Michael Bourne's piece, he is retired now. He worked a lot in the later part of his career with Carol Lake, who's another fabulous needlepoint teacher. Um, so those guys did a lot of online classes through the Shining Needle Society. Um, you know, they just are fabulous folks. And they also have a lot of books out there. So we carry their books. Um, we carry all of Michael's designs. When we opened our shop, I contacted Michael and asked him if we could carry his designs. And he was already retired. This is only in 2017. We're just three years old this year. Um, we're not yet three years old. We won't be three years old until, um, well, we are. So we, we turned three as a brick and mortar on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. But the first year that we were open, we had to immediately close right after that and let them finish our building. And so we really didn't get back in our shop until the end of June. So we are, and we aren't. <laughs> we're, we're somewhere in between. We just don't know how old we are. Um, so anyway, right before we launched the shop, we talked to Michael and asked him if we could um, sell his designs. And he said, yes, of course. And Carol was very helpful with us to us with that as well and we wanted to also be able to teach and so he gave us the rights not exclusive rights of course um, anybody else could talk to him about it as well but we do have the rights to teach from his designs as well as sell those designs and so we use his designs for teaching beginning and intermediate needlepoint um, so you'll be using this Michael Bourne uh, free download as your first piece okay so that's what it looks like. Let's talk about <clears throat> tools of the trade. So I wrote practice on this one up on the selvage because it was just a little bit smaller. And that way, whoever got this one would know. Um, this is needlepoint canvas. And this is 18 count, 18 mono count canvas. And 18 count means that there's 18 stitches per inch. And this is cotton. Um, so it is a cotton. It is... Um, nice it feels nice it's stiff it's stiff so that you can do some of the stitches on it that we want to do and it'll hold those stitches in place now i'm going to show you two other kinds of fabric this is called congress cloth and this i think is um let's see it's a 24 count congress cloth this is a lot softer and it's still stiffer than linen it's somewhere in between the two but there are some needlepoint pieces done on Congress cloth. Um, so, you know, if you are looking through your stash and you have some needlepoint pieces or if you've done some needlepoint pieces, especially if you've done anything from Gay Ann Rogers, um, you probably use Congress cloth. And so that's also really nice um, ground fabric to work on. Okay. And if you want to see how that compares to, for example, a linen that you might use for embroidery or cross stitch, this is a 28 count linen band. Of course, it's a different color, but you see it's very soft. And this one's a little bit stiffer and this one's very stiff. And so when you talk about um, ground cloth, you know, um, the difference between what you might use for different types of needlework really comes down to sometimes just the amount of sizing in the fabric. Um, <clears throat> so 
This is can uh, cotton and it is needlepoint canvas and it's an 18 count and this is what we're going to be using. Okay? Now, let's talk about the thread that we're going to use. You can use a lot of different threads in needlepoint and that's the beauty of needlepoint is that you have a chance to use and, and experiment with a lot of different fibers. Um, this is watercolors from Karen Collections and we love it. I like it a lot because it has a lot of variegation in it. So you can use one strand of this and you can get a lot of different color changes. So if you look at um, my class piece, that's just one color thread. But those are all the different colors that one run through that thread. And when you're doing stitches like this Rhodes Heart or the Waffle Stitch, um, or even the scotch stitch, it's really pretty to use a variegated thread because you get to see the color change and it's just a very beautiful thing. My students in this class have used all kinds of different colors. There's another one. I've seen this one come out really beautiful. Um, so, you know, this is what we're going to use, but you'll have a chance as you progress through needlepoint to use all kinds of other different Fibers, metallics like crinic, um, silks, cottons. This is a cotton fiber. Um, lots of different things. Rayons. So these are just some of the watercolors that I pulled to show you. And I've seen most of these stitched for this class, and they're just gorgeous. So... Pretty thing. So when you, if you've ordered a kit from me for this, um, you've told me your favorite color or kind of what you like, and I've gone out and I've pulled one for you. Um, now, what do I keep it in? I keep it in these little floss away bags, and I always keep the number with it. Um, so you can use a snack size Ziploc if you don't have these floss aways. You can order these floss aways from us. But the color that I used on mine is called Jade, right? <clears throat> and I've always kept my needlepoint fibers in these floss aways, and then I put them on a ring and then um, I have them all on the ring so that's how I keep mine you know if you if you want those you know you can get them on our website this is 36 in here floss aways for six dollars um, but you can also use snack size ziplocs if you are at home and you know don't want to order or you just have some of those Okay, so we have talked about canvas, we've talked about needles a little bit, we have talked about how you store your fiber, we've talked about your fiber. Um, I want to show you a couple of other things. I want to show you a set of stretcher bars. This is a big set. This is an 18 inch set of stretcher bars. And this is one of the pieces, one of the stretcher bars that we have for the class coming up that we're sponsoring, or not a class, but a stitch along coming up with um, one of Debbie Rowley's piece, pieces called um, Royal Garden. And um, Vonna and Gary on Fiber Talk are going to be stitching that. I'm going to stitch it with them. It's a beautiful piece. I will show you a picture of it, I think, if I have one here. Yes. So this is a picture of it. I'll put a better one somewhere. Um, and it looks very advanced, but once you do this beginning class, I think you'll see that you can manage some of these stitches. Um, and you see, she's got some similar things in here. I don't know exactly what those are. I haven't looked at them in detail yet, but, and a lot of this is open canvas. So I think you will be able to do this if you want to, but these 18 inch stretcher bars are required for that. Um, for what we're doing with this little guy, you don't need stretcher bars. He's really tiny. You can hold him in hand, and that's why we picked a little one, so that you could hold it in hand. Um, so you don't really need these. But the way these work is these are just regular plain stretcher bars. They are not adjustable, meaning that there are some stretcher bars like Evertots, and there's another one, a new one out that I know Gary's very fond of on Fiber Talk, that have some screws in here that allow you to expand the stretcher bar some because if you take our intermediate class we'll show you how to set up your piece but you basically fit these stretcher bars together and they fit together right here like this and they go in there like that and then your piece is thumbtacked to bars right 
And so here are the tacks. They're just kind of, they're not really exactly like the thumbtacks you might buy at the store for other things because they're pretty thick and durable and they come with a little tool so that you can pop them out. Um, and if you use these regular stretcher bars and you take some time to complete your piece, you will likely have to unpin it and re-stretch it. They're called stretcher bars because you stretch the canvas across them and you tack it down. Um, so all that stuff will come in our second lesson. Um, or if you decide you want to sit your royal garden, you know, I'll show you how I set up my canvas there for that too. But I wanted you to see what these are because you hear people talk about them and they're stretcher bars and they're typically not very expensive. These don't have a price on them because they just came in, but they're, you know, just a few dollars for the set. And you always need two sets because you have to make a square, right? So... This is a little bit more advanced piece um, that I did. And you can see, I hope you're not getting a lot of glare on it, getting a little bit of glare. But you can see um, lots of different stitches in here. But you see a scotch stitch here. And um, I think this is a waffle stitch right here. Maybe not. I can't remember what that is. I don't remember, and I don't have the instruction books. But I, I feel like that's a waffle stitch right there. Um, and then you've got some chronic here. This is some silk in here. These might be silks or flosses. Another metallic there. I mean, the beauty of this, and this has got, if you look underneath here, so this kind of this plaited stitch going across the top has chronic laid underneath it. And, and the canvas is an overdyed canvas. We Kind of an overdyed canvas. It has a pattern on it. Um... And most of these threads are from Karen collections because they do some really beautiful over dyes where you can see the variegation in a change. Now, <clears throat> this toolie that I have in my hand here is a laying tool. And I use it when I'm doing instruction with people to um, point things out. <clears throat> but it's also a laying tool. You don't have to use a laying tool for what we're doing because you're using a single strand. But as you advance into... Um, needle point where you've got more than one strand you would absolutely need a laying tool this is a little wooden laying tool this is called a best laying tool and this is a metallic and this is the one that i use at home and i love it um it's this one is 17 dollars, so it's a little more expensive um it's a very little metal kind of a stiletto thing Try not to lose this lid and pop it across the room. But the reason that I love this and the reason that a lot of people love it is because it has this very narrow tip. And you can get right up under the thread. And when we do an intermediate piece, I'll show you how to, how to use a laying tool. Um, but you come up on one side. When you lay your stitch back down, you slide this underneath it. And as you're pulling from underneath, you kind of rub this around. And right when you pull the thread all the way through the fabric, you pull this out. And it makes your little threads lay like little soldiers. Little soldiers. Just flat. <clears throat> so, a best laying tool is a great investment. Um, if you like the feel of wood, you can also use a wooden one. And we've got some wooden ones here for sale, too. If you're traveling, you definitely need a wooden one. Because this metal one won't make it through security at the airport. So... That's that. All right, so what do you say we get started? So I'm going to get my stuff together, and I will be right back, and we will get started. Okay, we're back. So you've got a skein of watercolors. Now, if you're doing this from stash, um, you can use floss. Um, you can use whatever you want, but um, for purposes of the demo, we're going to be using this watercolors. Now, you can spend a lot of time, and you can untie this thing, or you can just... Snip that off. Now keep this little label because you want to put it in your little floss away bag um, and have that. Okay. And so you just kind of unwind this here. This should pull out right there. Did you see how that happened? So, and you just want to unwind it here. Okay. This is also cotton. So this is a cotton fiber. 
So cotton always responds to the touch of, of a human hand. It lacks the warmth. Um, you can, you know, untie that or you can just snip that knot, knot off. All right. Now you've got two pieces because um, I just cut a thread. So right here's the other end and here's one end. And so I want to cut that off. <clears throat> now, um, I would encourage you not to just cut this thing here on the end because for some stitches you may want a longer thread and some stitches you may not want a long thread. Now the first thing I'm going to show you is a basket weave. Um, it's a very basic stitch and we're going to be using one strand. Watercolors has three strands in it. So if I hold it in my hand here and I pop it on the top like a little bunny foo foo, it'll separate out. That's called making it blossom. So it separates out. So for a basket weave, I don't need a really long thread. I don't want to cut it too short because it makes it useless for um, some of the rest of the stuff that we're going to do. So I'm going to pull it to about the length of my arm. Um, and I'm going to cut it. Okay. Now, I tie this thing in a little slip knot. Like that. And a little hank. <clears throat> and the next time I want it, I just pull it out. Okay. If you feel like you're going to get this thing all tangled up and you want to go ahead and cut it somewhere and put, make it into strands, you can do that. Just understand that as you do some of the road stitches, the heart and the box in the middle require a pretty good piece of thread and you may have to stop and restart. Okay, so that's tied in a little hank. I'll put that with this little label in one of my floss away bags. Okay, I'll put that aside. Now, I showed you how the end kind of blossomed out. It doesn't really matter which end you use. So you want to grab one of the three strands and you hold uh, the three plies. Technically, these three pieces in here are called plies. They're also strands because they've got some threads that make them up. But the big piece is a strand, little pieces are plies. And so this is three ply thread. So you're going to hold the strand still in your non-dominant hand and you're going to take your dominant hand and you're just going to pull that one straight out. Okay? And then you're going to smooth this part back down and you're going to put it aside to use later. So now you have a single ply. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if you've seen some of my other videos, you've watched me thread a needle this way. This thread's a little thick to get through the eye. I usually can get it just like that. Um, but if you have trouble getting it through the eye, use a threader. And so we give out a threader in class. I am going to, if you buy the little kit from us, you'll get one of these little threaders. The first three kits that went out, the first three or four didn't have it in there, so I'll be dropping that in the mail to you, so don't, don't fret. Um, to use a threader, this is just a real simple little inexpensive threader. You take the end of it and you put it through the eye of the needle. Right? And then you take the little strand and you put it through the hole. Which may be not be as easy as it looks. It's a lot easier with a smaller strand. Okay. And then you kind of Pull this thing back through here and be a little bit gentle with it. Don't yank it too hard or you'll cut the thread. So that's how you use a threader. Let me show you that one more time. Okay. Let's see if this big end will go through here. I don't know if it will. It won't. You have to use the small end. So you put the small end through. You may have to snip that to where it's a nice clean cut. Put it through there. Pull it through a little bit. See, I've got a, a little tail through there. And then you want to hold the needle and you want to kind of waffle this back and forth. You don't want to yank too hard or you could end up cutting the thread. Okay, and now it's through. All right. So we're going to pull it down. Okay. 
And, you know, if you look at, you don't want to have too much gel, but you want to be able to stitch with it. Now, I'm doing an away knot, and I know some people don't like away knots, waste away knots, but that's what we're using to get started. It's the easiest way to do it. Um, you can do an away knot where you put it in the line of stitching and you stitch over it, or you can do a waste away knot where you've got it away from your stitching, you leave enough to thread your needle with, and then you can weave it under when you're done. And so I've tied a couple of just regular square knots in the end of that. I'm using this little piece to demo the basket weave on. Now my basket weave, you're going to have a diagram. You've got a diagram that shows you how to do basket weave. Basket weave traditionally goes on a diagonal. And that's what makes it hard. It's a little bit hard to see. So if you look at your diagram, which is clearly labeled basket weave, um, you'll see that it's small stitches going over the intersections of these fibers, this interlocking canvas, to create a, a diagonal leg. And then you're going to come back down the diagonal, go back up the diagonal, come back down the diagonal. You're going to practice this in, until you feel comfortable with it. Okay, so an away knot goes into your line of stitching. A waist away knot goes somewhere over here and you thread it back under. So I am going to do um, a waist away knot just to keep it out of our way so that when you look at the back of this, you understand why it's called a basket weave. Now, if you were doing a bigger piece, you would have to have it in stretcher bars. Basket weave is a very durable stitch. It's a very pretty stitch. It creates on the back of the canvas, it'll make it look like a woven basket, and that's why it's called basket weave. Um, it uses a lot of thread. It's traditionally used in church kneelers and things that you need to just take a lot of um, testing, I guess. And um, and it's used in those places because it has a lot of thread, and it would take a long time to wear through it. Um, so, sorry, I'm shaking the camera. <laughs> Try not to do that. Um but it starts on the diagonal. So we're going to come up. It doesn't really, it, let's see, we're going to come up. Um, we're going to come up in a place where the top thread is going to be crossing over. And that is called a vertical thread. So you want to come up by a vertical thread. Now, we'll also, you also have a diagram. I'm saying we will because I haven't sent you these things yet. But you'll also have a diagram of a vertical, what a vertical thread means. But I can show you right here. So, if you look really close at the canvas, see where my needle's coming out? This thread that's right beside it is going over top of the thread above it. That means that this thread that I'm sitting beside that I'm getting ready to stitch over is a vertical thread. It's vertical, which means up and down, and it's laying on top of this thread. If you really want all of your stitches to lay nicely, you will always start by a vertical thread. If you forget to do that, or if you can't tell what it is, it is not the end of the world, especially on this practice piece. So, we come up. Now, the first stitch, if you look at your diagram, just crosses over this little intersection. That's it. Up at one. Most stitch diagrams always show you up on the odd, down on the even. So we came up here in this hole beside this vertical thread. We're going to count over one thread and up one thread, and we're going to go down. So we're just crossing over that diagonal. Now, one thing we didn't talk about is edges. Um, Usually I try to trim the edges so that it's really nice for you. I didn't do this one because it's just a piece laying here that I'm practicing with. Your pieces will be nicely trimmed. And when you're doing a bigger piece, they will be taped because you'll be attaching them to a set of stretcher bars. And the tape, A, keeps you from snagging your thread on it, and B, it makes it easier to thumbtack down. So... Um, your larger canvases will have tape on it. Now, if you get a piece of canvas that's not taped and you need to tape it, try not to use masking tape. Use painter's tape, either artist tape or painter's tape. Painter's tape from Lowe's or Home Depot. I like to use the green just because it's green, but you can use blue. You can use whatever you want to if it's painter's tape. It doesn't really leave a residue when it comes off, so it's a gentler tape. Okay, so that was the first stitch. Up at one, down at two, and it went over a vertical thread. Now, 
This is where it gets a little tricky because the basket weave, you're stitching on the diagonal. So your next stitch, I'm going to show you how to count it. From where you started, come over one thread and up one thread. Now I'm talking about threads, not holes. So a lot of my students, people see things two ways. Um, here we're doing needlepoint. They see holes or they see threads. Um, you're going to hear me count threads because this is counted thread canvas. It is um, easier if you count the threads than it is if you count holes. You'll get yourself twisted up if you start counting holes. They may often be one and the same, but don't fall into that trap. Count the threads. <laughs> so, so you, from where you started at one, are going to count over one thread and up one thread. And that's where you're going to start, okay? So here I am, over one thread and up one thread, okay? That was three, okay? This was one, this was two, this is three. Now I'm going to go down at four. So I'm going to go up one thread and over one thread and go down at four. All right, so now you have two little stitches on the diagonal. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing. From where I started on three, I'm going to count over one thread and up one thread. Okay, now you see how I'm making a little diagonal row. And now I'm going to count up one thread and over one thread, and I'm going to go down. I want you to do this for a nice little row. Okay? You'll start to see the pattern. Right? Over one thread, up one thread from where you started. Now to come back down, you go up one thread and over one thread. Okay? So from where you started, over one thread, and up one thread, right? And to go back down on the second part of that stitch, up one thread and over one thread. You're just hitting the diagonal, but if you can't see it, count it. If you can see it, go ahead and do it, but be careful, because if you miss a stitch, your basket will be off. All right, so from where you started, over one thread and up one thread. Now to go back down, you go up a thread and over a thread. And this seems simple to some people. Some people get this right off. And some people don't. And everybody gets to practice if you're in class. <laughs> so we sit here and we do this for, you know, several minutes. All right, because you need a nice little run of it. And if you can't see it, just keep counting it. All right? So from where you started on your last stitch, go over one thread and up one thread. And that's where you come up. And if your stuff gets bunched on the back, just reach your hand behind it and unravel it just like I did. Just finesse it a little bit. Okay. And then to go down, you go up one thread and over a thread. Okay, so I'm getting ready to come up. So from where I started that last stitch, I'm going to count over a thread and up a thread. Okay. Now to go back down, I'm going to go up a thread and over a thread. Okay. I'm getting ready to start over a thread, up a thread. To go down, up a thread, and over a thread. If you're bored, just start stitching. <laughs> so, over a thread, and up a thread, up a thread, and over a thread to go back down. So, now I'm going to say on your practice piece, you need to stitch at least 10 of those 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 13, 14. I made 14. That's probably fine. If you want to keep going, keep going. Um, don't make it crazy long because you need to have some other room on your practice piece. All right.
Now we're going to come back down. So basket weave is not just one little row of stitch. Basket weave is a filling stitch and it's used in a large area and you would put it in that area and then you would stitch over it or you would put it in that area as a filling stitch. Okay. So now you need to come back down your diagonal. And if you look at your diagram, you'll see actually that's perfect. My diagram went to 14. Um, and then we started coming back down on 16. So, um, let's see. Well, my diagram went through seven stitches, so I've done twice as many. That's okay. All right. So, you want to start coming back down. Now, to come down, look at where you first came up for that last stitch, and you come over one thread. But this time, you're not going up a thread. You just come over a thread. Right? So you came up right beside that last stitch. And now you want to go up a thread and over a thread. Now from here, you're following the same pattern. Okay? And you see what I'm doing if my thread gets bunchy. And, you know, you can always, like, try to untangle your thread if it's getting tangled. Let it dangle. All right. Now we're going down. So you see how we came up right beside that stitch. Now we're going to start going back down. What we're going to do is fill in these gaps between these stitches. Think of this as like a zipper teeth. Now you want the other side of your zipper, and it should fit right in snug right there with it. Right? So this is one side of the zipper. Now you're going to zip it up, and you want to go right down through there and fill in those spaces. Okay? So from where I came up on that stitch, I want to come down a thread and over a thread. Right? Does that make sense? So our last stitch started beside the last one we did going up the diagonal. We just came over one thread, and then we did the same pattern up and down. Now, we're going to be going back down the diagonal. So from where we started our last thread, you want to come down one thread and over a thread. Now, you want to go in between these two threads. So if you were to count it, it would be up a thread and over a thread. It's hard to see because you've got a stitch in there, but that's what it is. So to figure out where to go down, it's up a thread and over a thread. And you go down right there. Now, I did say in the beginning this was not the easiest stitch to learn, but once you get it, it's very methodical. Okay? So now you've got two little teeth that lay right on either side of that last stitch. Okay, so we want to get in here and do this next one. So from where you started that last stitch, you come down a thread and to the right one thread. Okay. All right. Now, you count to figure out where you go down at. Up a thread and over a thread. And it's going to put you right between those two little teeth. Okay, so you are making a little zipper, right? So from the where you started the last stitch, come down a thread and over a thread. That's an easy one to see. You come up right there, and you're just going over that diagonal intersection right there. Is all you're doing, just covering that diagonal intersection. You're going right between those two stitches you did on your way up that diagonal. Okay. That's another way to think about it. You can count it or you can look at it. So come down a thread and over to the right of thread. That's where you come up. And you can count up a thread and over a thread. It's hard to see. Or you can just cross over that diagonal and sit right between those two little teeth that you did going up. You see how that's starting to look? Okay. So if you can see the pattern... You can just start going down through here and filling it in. You're just covering the diagonal. You can also look at your diagram. And the stitches are numbered there. And each line on that diagram represents a thread. Okay? See, once you can see this and your mind makes that jump and you can see what you're supposed to be doing, this becomes just very meditative. Okay. All right. Let's count one again. Let's come down a thread, over a thread to the right. Come up. 
And you want to go down between these two teeth. You just want to go over the diagonal so you can just see it and go between them. Or you can count out, which is up a thread and over a thread. Okay. Okay, down a thread, over to the right one thread. Look for the diagonal intersection and go down right there. And if your thread's getting caught on your edges, and it shouldn't be, but if it is, you know, feel free to get some painter's tape and tape it. Okay. And I do try to, you know, untwist my thread sometimes as I'm bringing the needle back up. Okay. So I'm just going over the diagonal right there. You can see that between these two teeth. There's a there's an empty hole right there. So up a thread and over to the right of thread or just pop it through over the diagonal intersection. You get this under your belt, everything else is a piece of cake. All fun stuff. And you you know in contemporary needlepoint you don't use this basket weave a lot. But you should know how to do it. Okay, we're getting to the end of um, my row of 14 stitches. Okay, so. You want to do one more. Come down here on the other end of that one. Following our diagram. Okay. All right, I'm going to get my thread untangled. Okay, so that's nice. You've got a little zipper there. It's pretty, isn't it? Now we're going to go back up again, and that's how you do a basket weave. So now I'm going to come from where I started my last stitch, which is right there. See where my needle is. I'm going to count over a thread, just one thread, and then I'm going to Again, fill in that little diagonal stitch. My thread's twisty. Okay, so if I can see that pattern now, I'm just going down on this diagonal here. If I can't see it, I'm going to count it. So I'm going to go up a thread and over a thread, and that's going to put me in the right spot to go down. Okay, now to get to where I need to come up at, come over one thread and up one thread on your second stitch. Only your first stitch comes up right beside the last one. Either going up or coming down. You remember up here, this one was right beside the last one. Starting back up, this one was beside it. Only the first stitch in the diagonal path is beside it. Everything else, you're over a thread and up a thread because you're crossing over a diagonal um, intersection. Okay? All right, so from where that last stitch started, I'm going to count over one thread and up one thread. Okay. And then to figure out where to go down, I'm going to go up a thread and over a thread. It's the same. A little tough to see, but it's exactly the same. So from where I came up the last time, over a thread and up a thread. And I'm, I use this nomenclature. Some people don't like it, but clean hole, dirty hole. So now you come up in a clean hole and you go down in a dirty hole. That hole already has a thread in it. That's why it's called that. So, and this doesn't mean your needlework is dirty. It's never, hopefully never dirty, but it just is a way to remember that you're coming up in an empty hole and down in a hole that has a thread in it. All right. So I've came up, I'm going to count over up a thread and over a thread and go back down. Okay. Now, to get to the next spot, I'm going to count over one thread and up one thread. And then I'm going to go over the diagonal to go down. If you can see it, it's okay. If you can't see it, you need to count it. So over a thread and up a thread before I come up. And then to go back down, it's up a thread and over a thread. And go down. Okay? You're just going right back up this scissor, zipper and building it on the diagonal. Okay. If it's hard, count it. Over a thread, up a thread. Some people can see patterns. 
And some people can't, and it's okay. Sometimes your mind just needs to adjust because you're just not used to doing this. To go down, go up a thread and over a thread, and then go down. Okay. So from where you started the last stitch, over a thread and up a thread. That's where you come up in a clean hole. You're going down in a hole that already has thread in it, which is a dirty hole. It's over the diagonal intersection. Right, so you can just go there or you can count it up a thread and over a thread. All right, over a thread and up a thread, come up. Up a thread, over a thread to go down. Okay. So finish out your diagonal row like that. And if you make a mistake here, don't feel bad. Most people do. <laughs> so, and I do if I'm not paying attention, right? So this is not something to get worked up over. Okay, I'm at my last stitch on that row. Now, I want to go back down. I have reached the end of this diagonal. To go back down, I'm literally going to just come over one thread. All right. Okay. Then I'm going to go up a thread and over a thread. And that starts me on a new path down. So to start a new column or a new, a new row of the zipper, I go over a thread. You did it the same down here. We did it up here. You're going over. Now, if you look at what you've got, you literally, if you looked at the row, you would have four stitches going across that row. One, two, three, four. Two on the top, four on that one. So now I'm going to come from where I started that last stitch down a thread and over a thread. Okay. And then I'm going to start filling back in the zipper. Now I'm going to come up a thread and over a thread to cross over that diagonal intersection. Okay. From where I went up, down a thread, to the right one thread. That brings me up in a clean hole. And if you don't keep your thread entangled on the back or untwisted, it's going to bunch up there every time. So it's okay. Alrighty. And then you can just go over the diagonal intersection and go down. Because you're filling that in if you can see it. If you can't see it, you can count it. Okay, so coming down, down a thread, over a thread. That shows me where to come up. Up a thread, over a thread, that will take me down. Down a thread, over a thread, that's where I come up. Up a thread, over a thread, that's where I go down. Okay, so you just keep doing that. And work your way down. I want you to do this till you run out of that thread and hopefully you'll have this is our fourth row hopefully you have between five and six rows okay because I want you to get used to the way this canvas feels in your hand I want you to get used to pulling on the needle if you've done a lot of um, cross stitch or um, embroidery you know that you're pulling on your needle a lot harder than you do on your other stuff and that's why this canvas is stiffer so that you can do that okay get into my last stitch here so for my last stitch I'm going to come down a thread and over a thread and that is going to put me um, to get to where I need to go down, up a thread and over a thread, just cross over that diagonal, and you've got your last little stitch there. Okay, I'm going to do one more actually. I'll come down one more. 
Okay. All right. Now, to start going back up, I'm literally going to just come over one thread from where I started the last time. Coming over a thread straight to the left. I'm not going up. I'm just coming over. So it's literally coming up in the hole right beside where the other one came up. Now, to figure out where to go down, I'm filling in the teeth again. I'm going to count up a thread and over a thread and go down. And you may not be able to see the hole there, but it's there. So from where I came up on that stitch, I'm going to count over a thread and up a thread. Now we're back in the same pattern, over and up. And then to go down, up a thread and over a thread and into that hole. Okay. And if you're stitching over your away thread, that's fine. Don't worry about that. The thread you use to make your way knot. Now you're going to march back up this column doing the same thing that you've done the other times. I want you to do enough of this, like I said, so that you get comfortable with it, the ins and the outs of the fiber and the canvas. Also, I want you to do enough to where you do understand the basket weave stitch. Um, and then I want to show you something on the back that you can't see if you've not done several rows. So, and I know some people say they hate this stitch. I don't hate this stitch. Um, it has a very utilitarian purpose. It creates a lot of density and you need density if you're doing something that's going to have a lot of wear and tear. Um, like a kneeler, a church kneeler. And it also creates a really beautiful background. So that's always nice to have something to stitch on. It does use a lot of thread. And if you're ever doing it on a big piece, you need to have it on stretcher bars. Because it will cause your fabric to twist. And it won't be square. So on this little small piece we're doing, we're not going to be doing hardly any basket weave. If you do any at all, I just wanted you to know how to do it. Um, so you don't need the stretcher bars. But... You would if you were doing this on a big piece. Otherwise, it would be really out of square. And then it has to get what's called blocked. Where, um, you know, you have to pay somebody to actually uh, go in and square back up. Okay. So, we're going to stop there. And I'm going to come over a thread. I could have kept going another stitch, but I didn't. And now I'm going to go down on the diagonal intersection. I'm going to start coming back down. So now I'm going to come down a thread and over a thread, right? And I'm going to find that diagonal intersection and go down right there. You can also count it up a thread and over a thread. Okay. So if you can't see it, count it down a thread, over a thread to come up, to go down, up a thread and over a thread. Okay. And just fill this one back in. Just march back down your zipper. Zip it up. And, you know, if you're like me, see how that's twisting up? You need to try to keep that thread untwisted. You just have to twirl it in your hand. Or let it dangle behind the canvas and twirl and untwist itself. But... You can start to see some of the variation in this thread, too. It's pretty. Okay, I'm going to do one more stitch on this end. 
Alrighty, so that is um one, two, three, four, five, six rows of that basket we stitched, which should be enough. So turn it over and look at the back, and you see it looks like it's woven. This is variation in the thread right there coming through. It's kind of fun. So you see how it looks like it's kind of woven? That's why they call it a basket weave. And the more that you do, the more it'll look woven like that. And you see how thick that is? That gives a lot of durability to this. And if you were going to use this as a church kneeler, see it looks very nice and soft and flat on the top. It's got all this bulk on the back. Um, it'll provide a lot of durability over the years. That won't wear out. So that's why it was used. And it was also used um, on some tapestries to provide, you know, warmth, really. So they were hung on walls and they um, then, you know, kept warmth in the rooms on stone walls. So very traditional stitch, and that's basket weave. Um, so that's how it looks. And you see I stitched over my way through it a little bit. To end this off, you're just going to run it underneath. And when you run it underneath, it's, it's probably going to, you know, you're going to see it. It's going to disturb that basket weave a little bit. That's okay. And uh, you might have to tug that needle a little bit, but that's also okay. All right. And I'm going to snip this away, not off the front. I'm going to re-thread my needle with it. I'll see if I can do my little trick. If not, use your needle threader. And I'm just going to run this <clears throat> underneath. There's a whole lot of thread in here, so it's not going to disturb anything on the front. I'm not worried about that. And that is very secure. That is not coming out. Alrighty. So, that's a basket weave. How do you feel about that? Fun stuff. You can see it can get meditative. Once you see the pattern, it can get very meditative. All right. So, that was your very first needlepoint stitch. And that's the most basic needlepoint stitch in terms of uh, utilitarian and, you know, ones that people use and what's traditionally thought of as needlepoint. If you looked at... Um, older needlepoint it was done with wools on canvas like this patternaya was one of the brand names of the wool it's still around um, and most of the stitching was done in basket weave now so let's talk about this so let's say you were filling in a corner what would you do you you would do basket weave as much as you could and if you were actually doing a corner you could do the whole thing in basket weave and get up in the corner if you're doing some odd shapes like we're going to be doing around our heart you're going to have to do um What's well, not tr not real be more like cotton, more like continental, where you're really just going, you know, a few stitches here and there to fill in around that heart, and that's okay, um, because you're doing it for decoration, not utilitarian. But I really wanted you to know how to do a true basket weave, and that's what it is. It goes up and then back down and fills in up and back down, and it's always done on a diagonal. And to make it really good, you need to start by a vertical thread, um, which we did, if you remember. We came up in a hole that was right beside a vertical thread, and a vertical thread is one that goes over top of the thread underneath it. And that's where we started. <clears throat> so congratulations. If you've done that, you have done basket weave, and you have done your very first needlepoint stitch. So I'm very proud of you. I hope it went okay for you. Um, don't be upset if you made a few mistakes. Everybody does. Almost everybody does at some point. Now, I have done it. Most people who've done any kind of needlepoint have done that. I've missed a stitch here or there and had to correct it. Um, and if you struggled with it, please don't feel bad about that. And please don't let it make you quit because you're going to enjoy the next stitches. And so, um, you know, if you struggled with that and you feel a little down about it, come back to this next piece and watch us do this next stitch. And I think you'll want to jump back in because it's, it's a lot of fun. So please don't let it get you down. Learning means making mistakes and in, in needlepoint and needlework it usually means taking some thread out and going again. <laughs> and so, you know, everybody learns a little bit different. So, you know, don't feel bad if you're having to count the whole time. It will come to you. It's a pattern. It's muscle memory. That's why I made you do so much of it. 
um, it, it's not one that you're going to have to use a lot in contemporary needlepoint. So, you know, don't don't lose any sleep over the fact that you hated needle uh, basket weaving. And if you love basket weaving, congratulations. Um, you can use it whenever you want and you can feel meditative about it. So I'm going to um, re-thread up and come back and show you the very next stitch. So hang tight. We'll be right back. 